All right, so let's conclude today's training with the wrap up. We kind of went fast today, I think. So just yeah, a summary of some key, or maybe it was Matt and Marshall knocking out the questions. Who knows? Teacher of record should be reported, right? So on census day, report the teacher of record, even if they're on leave, report them as the teacher of record, sign them to the course. Substitutes should only be reported for vacant positions. All staff must have a uh, staff demographic record submitted every year, if for no other reason than to update the service years, both lo local LEA service years and total. Staff without seeds that should be reported may obtain seeds from the CTC with a certificate of clearance. So if you're trying to decide if your staff should be reported, are they in a certificated position? So consider your administration, right? Superintendents, yes, they should be reported. Should the CBO be reported, the business official? Probably not. Is that even a certificated position? Is it classified? So you want to report those. And you could look at non-classroom-based job assignments to kind of get an indication if it's a certificated position or not. There is no non-classroom-based job assignment for CBO or CTO, right? So that kind of will help you. Staff assignments are reported by school and job classification, not by assignment. So your teachers may teach courses. They may be mentor teachers. They may have, they may be TOSAs as well. That's three different assignments. Two of them are non-classroom based. And that's how it would be reported. A single job classification, a single staff assignment record, but multiple assignments in that record. When a, a teacher should have multiple assignments is when that one job classification is at two different schools. So like an itinerant teacher who's doing PE at two different schools, right? You'd have one for each school or staff members teaching at a school and has a job classification 12, but is also the principal. That a, a second job classification of 10 because they're administration. So that's what we mean. Staff assignments are reported by school and job classification, not assignment. Student course data should be submitted for all students kindergarten through 12th enrolled on census day, primary enrollments and short-term enrollments. EL students should must be enrolled in at least one course section where the education service code is populated to show they are receiving services or have declined services. So, you know, oftentimes the question comes up, we have an EL student, but the parent has did declined services. That would be reported with the five. That's why that code was introduced, right? You have an EL student and they're not receiving services. So that's a five. You, can't, you don't have the option of not reporting the service for an EL student. You basically, you know, and that's telling the CDE, if you were to get on it, that yes, we know we have this student who's not receiving services. And you should have some local record of the parent declining the services. That then your post-secondary status data should be only for CTE completes for fall two. Students with disabilities is reported into year four. And then uh, students may have multiple post-secondary outcomes. So you can go to the military and college. All right. So this. This diagram is old, probably could update it, but it, it just shows the, the process of CalSAS and assignment monitoring. And, you know, we just want to emphasize that it's an entire process that doesn't end in CalPads. So you want to report the data as it, you have it, right? You may have misassignments, you may have vacancies, things that are outside of control, things that you may worry don't reflect well on your LEA. Report them anyway. There's always a, a, a way to justify it at the end or during the process, right? You, you know, you have a monitor authority which you answer to. And once it's outside of CalPAD, it most often gets delegated to someone else. So just some food for thought, some hamburger sandwiches for you all. If you don't report any assignments, they can identify any misassignments. So there's always the option, right? Maybe not. And 
the suggested milestone. This is a perfect world, perfect scenario, right? This is if you certified fall one in December, it was good, and you had not had to touch fall one data at all since then. You used the whole month of January for fall two. So realistically, many of us are submitting our files now or getting in position to submit the files now. So it's fine, right? Again, I believe the fall two deadline is tenuous. I haven't heard anything. But I think, you know, Kyron, Marshall, and I have been sliming if he's still available. We've been doing this for a long time, each of us more than 10 years. And it's a tight window from fall, the, the end of fall one Friday to February 24th. So I would just encourage you to submit your data, resolve submission errors, submit tickets, contact your monitors, and, you know, try to get a good start to fall two. Be consistent, don't have lulls. But when you know, you know, sometime this month, considering the deadlines on the 24th, you want to be able to resolve certification errors and then send reports. So, I guess the significance of the timeline is to show you that you don't want to send reports the day before the deadline, you want to try to get your data in and review reports with some time for them to consider the data and recommend changes if needed. And then, you know, give yourself a week to certify again. You want to include a report review in the process, any amendments, and certify by the deadline. So again, a reminder the fall two deadline currently sits at 224. If you need support, use the web form, right? You can access this from the home page at the bottom on the right of the CalPad user manual. There's a help menu in CalPads itself. And it may also be in the footer of CalPads, definitely in the help menu in CalPads. As far as resources, several courses in Bridge, we're adding them all the time. Same with YouTube. YouTube also has the Q&A recordings, as well as short error videos, which we have recently started adding. I got one in the queue for Marshall for Fall 2. He did two or three last week. So uh, the error correction videos are back on and coming. The CalPad user manual, which is the most dynamic and frequently updated CalPads document. It's a great variety, variety of use source. You should become familiar with it. Use the search function. And then the commission on teacher credentialing. I like to put in Cal SAS information. Right. And I get to bypass this clunky website. If you just go to the home screen, trying to get here is a little bit tough. You type in CalSAS information. This is the CTC's information. Before, Brand, they had a lot of stuff on the Padlet. This is good now. You can see specific exception information, the exception overview process, determinations, exceptions, all, all a lot of stuff that we put in training is sourced from here. But these are the tools, the appropriate authorization or for CalPads coding. These are the tools that you would use or have your curriculum instruction use. And you can see if you type in a state course code, I'm going to make one up. I don't even know. Yeah. So you, you can see that you can type in the state course code. 9231. Why that? Special ed. <laughs> See, uh, you have yeah. all of the authorizations that you guys need. Or the name, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're different. So, and they have that for courses, disability categories, English learning services, non classroom based assignments. So, these tools are good to have handy that you'll find it there. So, thank you. I normally say you could ask questions at this time, but you've been a quiet group. I doubt if we have any questions. So let's let Marshall take it away. <laughs> You're just too funny today, guys. <laughs>